Okay, well, great. Well, thank you. That was a wonderful lunch, and it was great to see Bill and hear from him. I want to move on to um, a couple panels this afternoon. Move on to um, our next panel. It's on alternatives to bank to bankruptcy, and um, I, I don't introduce Steve Victor too much. He's already been introduced once, but Steve um, is moderating the panel. He's senior managing director at uh, DSI. He's more than 30 years experience successfully administering and managing both public and private companies involved in high stakes Chapter 11 and Chapter 7 bankruptcies now in court workouts. Significant experience in the sale of public sector companies and served as an independent manager and member of multiple boards of directors. So let me let me turn it over to Steve and also thank him for the wonderful words he gave at the lunch. Thank you. I think I'll turn it over to Lorenzo. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Lorenzo Marinuzzi. I'm the co-chair of the restructuring practice at Morrison and Forster, where I specialize in representing creditors and, and particularly official creditors committees in chapter of the bankruptcy cases. Hi everybody, I'm Rebecca DeMarv. I'm also a senior managing director at DSI. Uh, practiced law until about 18 years ago when I shut down my firm to join DSI. Uh, represented mostly debtors and served as fiduciary. And I'm still serving as fiduciary, but now hiring lawyers. Good afternoon, Matt Brooks. I uh, co-chair the restructuring group at Trout and Pepper. Uh, I'm a recent transplant from Atlanta to New York, so happy to be here today and hopefully get to know more. Hi, I think I've been introduced. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Steve Victor. I work with DSI. I know you, but you share your work. I have served as CRO, CFO, interim management, independent director and often fiduciaries and receiverships, chapter 11 trustee, and assignments for the benefit of creditors. All right, so we're gonna be talking today about alternatives to bankruptcy and why that's important. And we've got a PowerPoint that I'm gonna kind of bounce around for a few slides, but overall we're not gonna, not gonna use too much of it. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion today about bankruptcy in general why it's important, kind of the bankruptcy adjacent issues. Uh, but one of the things I think is interesting is that outside of this group, the level of discussion of bankruptcy in general uh, is increasing. You've got a ton of cases that are high profile in the media and non-bankruptcy professionals is sort of top of mind for them. And uh, obviously everyone knows the level of crypto collapse, uh, FTX, uh, today, I got a note on uh, my phone from New York Times that Block 5 filed today. And it brings to mind that outside of this room, you have more and more people discussing bankruptcy. And the mass for bankruptcy cases, uh, the Boy Scouts, some of those in the room today at the conference handled. And there's more of this level of discussion. Uh, but the thing that's often unnoticed is there's a whole world of restructuring uh, and distress in m and that happened outside of the bankruptcy courtroom. And for this group, we sort of ask ourselves, you know, why is that important for uh, a group, when I love this term to the user earlier, liability management professionals. Why is that important for people who largely do bankruptcy work? And the reason is because generally, the level of bankruptcy filings, as this chart here shows, have declined over the number of decades. And we could probably spend an entire panel on why the level of bankruptcy cases have decreased, kind of the obvious reasons, the cost, uh, the, the length of time, the variables, and uh, what was mentioned earlier, the fact that value can be eroded just at the talk of filing a case and certainly uh, at the filing of the case. And so with this decline in bankruptcy, uh, one question is, well, what are companies doing that have to restructure? And I'd love to have a slide that would show direct correlation with the decrease in bankruptcy with the increase in alternative. Uh, we don't have that. I can't say it's a hard and true fact. But the one thing that I have noticed in my practice, and I think others have, is that the level of bankruptcy alternatives have increased over time. Receiverships, 
assignment for the benefit of creditors. And it kind of goes back to uh, the fact that bankruptcies have become expensive and there are variables like a committee, a trustee, and you have a forum where all these people can come together and object, be obstructionists, whatever, whatever the issue is. And so people are looking elsewhere for how to restructure a company, how to sell an asset, or what to do with litigation. Uh, this is sort of what everyone thought would happen in the pandemic years with the number of bankruptcy cases, uh, or how they view bankruptcy lawyers in general. <laughs> but this chart shows what happened in the pandemic bankruptcies for this year, uh, 2022, were at their lowest level in almost 40 years. And there are a number of reasons for that. Obviously, a ton of government money uh, that poured in during the pandemic. Uh, but also, companies were figuring out how to work with lenders. Lenders didn't have a lot of pressure to put people into a case. Uh, and lenders, in general, have less of an appetite to go through restructuring. You have some lenders who have just a shell of what they used to have in terms of restructuring staff. And this chart also shows uh, it's front and center the level of commercial filings from 2018 to 2022 almost cut in half. You go from 22,000 to 13,000. And with that, with this decrease in filings, there's a lot of talk this morning about what's ahead for 2023. Businesses, clients are getting stressed from every angle. And where are we going to restructure uh, bad credits. How are we going to sell off companies if they're not going into bankruptcy? And like I said earlier, I, my practice is seeing a ton uh, of use of these alternative mechanisms, and particularly with state courts and receiverships that have business courts that are set up to be sophisticated. You have judges who know what a loan agreement is, uh, which is important when your clients are there facing issues. Uh, and the judge puts you on the tail end of the family court docket, and clients get a little worried about, do people, does this forum understand what we're here to do today? So the rest of the panel is gonna walk us through kind of what are these alternative mechanisms that are on the rise, and why you should vote out. So, let, let, before we get started with the alternatives, let's just overview bankruptcy for those of you who aren't that familiar with it. Traditionally on the company side, you've got chapter 11 and you've got chapter seven. So chapter 11 bankruptcy is one where the debtor remains in possession of its assets, operates its business, gets the benefit of a whole slew of tools in the bankruptcy code to reorganize itself. And those cases hopefully conclude with a confirmed plan of reorganization and the value of the company's assets are distributed in accordance with the priority scheme of the bankruptcy code. Chapter seven, similar except the debtor no longer remains in possession of its assets. A chapter seven trustee is appointed and the job of the trustee is basically to liquidate and monetize the assets of the debtor, sell what it can, and distribute whatever value is available to creditors, again, in accordance with the priority scheme of the bankruptcy code. So that was my work as a bankruptcy lawyer. And then there was a conspiracy of non-bankruptcy lawyers coming up with a system that was cheaper and more efficient, and we're gonna talk about that today. So for those of us that don't live in that world, why don't you tell us about some of the alternatives to bankruptcy? Thank you. Before I start, I want to talk about assignments for the benefit of creditors. Have any of you done one or been involved? A few. Good. I think assignments are extremely powerful. An assignment for the benefit of creditors is functionally the same as a, as a Chapter 7 bankruptcy where a trustee is appointed. But in an assignment for the benefit of creditors, the debtor, the escorts, some input from the secured lenders, get to pick the fiduciary the SNR or the SNE. What happens is under state law, and there are two types of, of state law, there's those that are statutory and describe the system and those that just say, yeah, an assignment's allowed or use common law. I'm gonna leave the statutory ones to Rebecca and talk about those that are in states where I don't need court approval. What happens in those cases is company calls me up and says, I need to do an assignment. I need to wind down. We either have a buyer or we don't have a buyer. And we want to, they want to turn over all the assets to me as that fiduciary for all creditors to find a way to liquidate and maximize the value of those, uh, of those claims. This is different 
then bankruptcy, which is a rehabilitative process. A, an assignment for the benefit of creditors is a liquidation. You can get through that and get past the, the rehabilitative part if you, as we talk about the sale process, you can do a lot of stuff that seems like a 363 sale. So when I leave after an assignment is taking place, if I've sold the assets and there's still a company there, I consider that a win. But let's get back to the mechanics. The assignment is effectuated by the, the creating of the execution of the trust agreement. It requires that the board of directors and the shareholders ratify and approve the assignment and the s and &E and the trust agreement. It requires the secured lenders, if any, to consent. Now that's hugely important because I can do an assignment and if I don't have the approval of the secured lender, I can't use their cash collateral. I generally reach out to them the second call and say, yeah, the company wants to do an assignment, You're probably familiar with their situation, and we think we can create a budget and we can create a sale process to maximize the value for you and the rest of the creditors. <laughs> After you negotiate that, you start the, the process, which always involves a sale. And a sale can be anything from an auctioneer to a stock and horse bid like we're used to seeing in bankruptcy. They can be done before the assignment, at the time of the assignment, and post-assignment. And what I, as a fiduciary, would need to decide is, was there enough, ro enough marketing, was the sale process robust enough to allow a sale to happen on the first days of the assignment, or is an insider involved, and do they want to buy, in which case I'm going to probably want far more robust sale, including uh, I, I don't have any problem selling to insiders. I just need it to be in a stocking horse fashion with a reasonable sale. So we, uh, we determine that and we then send it once the notices of the affidavit of the trust is signed. We send out notices to all creditors. So this is a lot like a bankruptcy. You know, we're not leaving people out there. The stakeholders, the employees, the creditors, they're all given notice of the process, given a claim form. It looks a lot like bankruptcy. It makes the creditors and the parties getting these notices feel like I've seen this process and here's a name and a number I can call, which is hugely important as well. The transparency and the credibility that all this process brings is, is what makes it all work. But then you go through, you talk to the creditors, you talk to buyers, you talk to banks, you talk to lenders, and you talk to the company and you see what you, what you can sell. Often it takes four to six weeks, which is pretty quick to, to line up a sale. And it depends again on the, the nature of the business. If it's a melting ice cube, you might not have four to six weeks. The other thing that is important on, on these assignments is as the fiduciary holding the trusts and escrow for all the creditors, I'm giving a, a standard of a lien creditor under the UCC. That means that if people want to go litigate, or there is litigation pending, that the only thing that litigation will do is fix their claim, will liquidate it. They are not going to jump ahead of other creditors and above my lien creditor status. That's a very powerful tool as well, because we don't get a stay in assignments for the benefit of creditors. So usually, we do the sale. There's funds. You pay back the, it's called the demo loan, the pre-assignment, the post-assignment loan that inevitably one had to give us, uh, probably the secured lender or the, the fund or investors. And then you pay the creditors in accordance with the priorities established by law, which look a lot like bankruptcy. Some states have, don't mention it all, some states have very old um, laws like Employee claims are limited to $50. That's not going to cut it. I generally try to use the bankruptcy code as the, uh, the measure for that. And then we go on to pay the creditors and do the taxes and move on and close the case. Now, there are other cases that Rebecca can handle that look a little bit like bankruptcy 
through a mechanism on over these receivership assignment, 128 assignments. And these are really becoming popular, so hopefully uh, Rebecca can convince all of you you should be one of these in Wisconsin. Can I jump in and ask you a question? Look at yeah. So in a Chapter 7, you mentioned transparency. In a bankruptcy, you typically have a judge who oversees the process and serves as kind of the gatekeeper, so to speak. How does that, what's what's kind of the governing principle in the sign that we have a sale and someone has to decide the process and make judgment calls? Well, in those states where there is no court supervision, that's left to me, and I generally try to do that as I would do it in a bankruptcy so that people get notice. If I'm going to do a sale, I try to give the notice of that to the people, to the creditors, so they can understand they don't have a forum to object in, but if there's a problem that they needed to resolve or an issue, probably I need to know that issue anyway. So, so they just call you. Yes. Now, there are lots of assignments that, while I'm talking to the client about what type you want to do or where you want to do it, or which venue, if you can see this is a case that's retail and there's going to be a lot of deposits and a lot of warranty and possibly a lot of discussions with the attorney general, I'm going to probably want to do that in a venue that has a court. It's just so much easier. I have a venue for them, uh, makes them feel better, and, and usually that, that solves it. So I, um, I did practice law in Wisconsin. Has anybody been drugged into or willingly or else <laughs> otherwise into a 128 in Wisconsin? In Wisconsin, yes, not a no. Okay. Well, I'm surprised how many people are. Um, I they a group of lawyers in the '80s, so pre me, got together and you know looked at the bankruptcy bench, and they weren't thrilled with what they were seeing, mostly for professional fee reasons. Um, and so they they took this uh, assignment and receivership statute, Chapter 128, creatively called, um, and they created the the practice that we use all the time, which looks um, where Steve mentioned that he sees an assignment as an alternative to a seven. Um, we do that sometimes, but more often than not, I describe the 128 process as a liquidating 11 with a trustee in state court. There's a lot there <laughs> in what I just said, but that's really how, um, how it works. So we, I, um, as receiver, um, operate and sell, you know, all kinds of companies, um, manufacturing companies, companies that didn't bother to fund their 401ks, um, lots of real estate, daycares over the years, you know, anything you can think of that you might um, see operating inside of a bankruptcy, we operate and sell inside of a Chapter 128. Um, I don't want to get overly specific to Wisconsin, but I, but I do think that it's interesting to look at because there's um, a movement nationally uh, to take a look at the process that we've always used in Wisconsin and adopt it. Um, and, and other states are codifying it. So Minnesota did it recently, Missouri's looking at it, Washington State's looking at it. Um, and I, I, I do think that it's, um, it's a trend, and I think it's a trend that, that will continue. Um, the actual statute in Wisconsin, though, dates back to the Bankruptcy Act. So, you know, it looks like a statute from the late 1800s. And it, it you know reads about that clearly, frankly. Um, I was surprised. Steve and I did an assignment in Michigan last year, and um, I didn't realize that the statute in Michigan looks very much like it does in Wisconsin, but they're just not using it, um, which I find kind of fascinating. The way that so much of this practice is localized. Um, people are form selecting into Wisconsin in order to take advantage of this. That seems to be happening more and more. Um, where they look at, you know, where they could possibly, um, what what state's process they could possibly use, and if they can pick Wisconsin, they, they do. It's kind of interesting. So I regularly have Delaware corporations in Wisconsin 128s, um, Illinois corporations in Wisconsin 128s. Sorry, but what's the basis for jurisdiction in Wisconsin for Delaware company? <clears throat> well, you know, it's interesting that came up recently, and number one, we've never seen it challenged. <laughs> so, so like everything else, <laughs> yeah. So like everything else, um, it's negotiated, and people at that point are usually happy to have um, a single point of contact where they can get their questions answered. So I haven't seen it, it, it challenged, but I do think if it were challenged, it would be a minimum contacts 
personal ju jurisdiction analysis. I mean, that's what I always come back to. So there needs to be some contact with the state, but. Is there the concept of related entity jurisdiction? You know, you have affiliated Chapter 11 filings, so you'll you know, have a, a mailbox somewhere where you want jurisdiction, you'll file that company, and then you'll put all 78 in. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. And I've seen that in Georgia, too, where people will open a bank account or a mailbox just to get jurisdiction. And if no one challenges it, then they're going to get it. I've seen that in bankers. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Um, so it is a, a court process. Um, it, it's fascinating. Since I joined DSI and I've been looking at these things more nationally and in a whole variety of states, I'm, I'm fascinated by the idea of doing it without a court. Like, I don't even... I understand what Steve says, like I understand the language, <laughs> but I, I can't imagine actually trying to get all of this done without, um, you know, the court in the background. Um, and that's sort of like the given process that that brings. Um, we do have commercial dockets now, and I think those are increasingly popular. Um, and that's nice, it moves more quickly. The judges are used to seeing these kinds of documents. The judges are used to this process because it's, you know, happens all the time. Um, I, I think probably the most important thing is what goes into the terms of the order appointing the receiver. Um, these can be, in Wisconsin, they're voluntary and involuntary, and that's how Minnesota is set up as well, and I think we're gonna see more of that. Um, and the, the order itself is going to contain everything. So the, in a voluntary one, the, the company does the assignment, the, give the assignment to the intended receiver, the receiver turns around and files a petition with the court, and that's how the case starts. In an involuntary one, it starts usually just like a foreclosure replevin kind of case. In fact, they're often pled in the alternative, so the creditor can choose which route to actually pursue. Um, but in any event, once they get going and the receiver's appointed, they look pretty much the same. Um, I don't think, uh, I, last I looked, I think my order is like 17 or 18 pages long, my form of the order. Um, it grows almost with every case <laughs> something gets added to it, because that really does set, set the parameters of my power and what people have to, you know, how they have to work with me, the claims process, um, the sale process, how much notice I have to give, and everything else. Um, Steve talked about the consent of the secured creditor. Um, you also have to have the consent of the secured creditors um, in all of these statutory processes to the extent that they are secured. Um, so there is a, a concept of doing a liquidation procedure to determine the value of their, of their collateral. Um, so what, between everything being wrapped up in the order and the fact that you need consent for everything, um, it turns into one long negotiation. So we were, we were talking about this a couple hours ago as we were preparing, and you know, there is no, um, there's no 365 in, in, I don't even think Minnesota has a, in any state court actions. Um, so, so you can't force the assumption and assignment of a lease or a contract. Um, that's true. So what happens is, is that you just, everything gets negotiated. So the buyer comes in, the buyer negotiates all of those issues. And I think that, between that is really a key theme um, across the board. Which is honestly, almost always the same way that it works in a, in a chapter 11. Is at the end of the day, it's all negotiated. So, Rebecca, I'm sorry, you're describing, and Stephen describes a process for the receivership in an ABC, which really sounds like a chapter 11 slash chapter 7 process intended to sell assets and wind down the company. And when you do that in a chapter 11, you do that in a 7, in 11 in particular, there are additional expenses. You have to pay for the committee, which you would have in an ABC, and you would have a receivership. But there are also tools available in a chapter 11 sale process. And I think people need to understand what exists and what doesn't exist, because there are some things that are very helpful and things that don't exist. But ultimately, there's a cost-benefit analysis, which I think is super important. So there, there, there is uh, the ability to raise financing, and you usually get it with the consent of the lender. Uh, but we know in a, in a Chapter 11 bankruptcy, when you raise fi financing, there's a process. Right? Notice everybody gets an opportunity to weigh in on it, negotiated terms, creditors get to object. How is it that a receiver or an SNE is able to get financing in bankruptcy if it's not consensual with the secured party? I don't think if you're, you're going to do an assignment for the benefit of creditors, 
without the consent of the secured lender. So it's basically like an 11 where you're selling the lender's collateral and they're going to have the consent to it. That's correct. Yeah. So there's a document with the consent of subordination agreement and use of cash collateral. Yeah, I would say that the, the financing agreements and the notice process and everything um, looks almost identical or can look almost so identical as what you would expect to see in 11. That's where you're going to see a car, your carve out. That's where you're going to see, you know, additional security going forward without the need to file financing statements, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but that being said, there's no, you know, adequate protection for the use of cash collateral concept. Can I ask you a question about just the pricing on asset sales? Do you get, first of all, what kind of buyers do you typically see? And does the the lack of the bankruptcy protections, like the free and clear, kind of the, the federal order that people can can uh, can use after the fact to block claims, does that does the lack of that have any value deterioration in these alternative mechanisms? Well, it's hard to know that in a vacuum, right? You don't know what you don't know. No. Um, that being said, I mean, we get, I get buyers internationally. You know, I have buyers from China, buyers from Japan, publicly traded companies buy out of 128s in Wisconsin. Um, you do get a state court order that says that the sale is free and clear. Um, I, I date myself, but when I would, used to describe that to, to debtors, I would say, you know, if you want the Cadillac, that's a Chapter 11, so it's more of a Buick. Um, but nonetheless, um, it exists. So, you know, does it de do you get less for it than you would in 11? It probably depends on the deal and the case and the setup and everything else. Maybe sometimes. And on my sales, I sell my right to an interest. I don't even give it free and clear, but, you know, if you can clear off the liens that are known sort of function you're saying. Right. And with regard to where do you start a sale, almost always I look for whatever had been done before, whether it was a financing or a sales effort. And usually they've tried something like that before they come to me. And so I have a sense of where value is. And if I can reach out to those same people that we were talking to before, or talk to the insiders, all I need is to get that stocking horse bid, and then I just do pretty much international press releases and I have a large network of like, different people who might think in different industries. So as soon as I get that, that offer, or if I'm looking for a stocking horse, I'm off to the races, reaching out to everyone that I know. And I think that by, I, I think that I feel good that we have a commercial reasonable sale and we maximize the value for that because of the strong outreach. And, and you mentioned just now stalking horse. So the concept of a stalking horse buyer, which we know exists in the Chapter 11 sale process, exists as well outside of bankruptcy? Yes. And you're, you're able to offer the same protections? Cool. Well, first of all, I'm not giving them any reps or warranties, right? <laughs> it's fair. So um, they're getting what they get, and when I convey the assets, they're right to have an interest. I mean, I if what you're getting at is sort of bid procedures, yeah, I negotiate all those same things. They get court approved break breakup fees, they get you know minimum overbids, however much they want to push, you know, it, it becomes a negotiation just like it wouldn't in a lot of And there, most of these people are, are sophisticated enough if after you found them, they're gonna ask for when they say stalking or they're gonna ask for the bid protection and the breakup fees, or the lenders or the fund. Manager may want to do an insider bid or may want to uh, bid in their debt. And you deal with that. And you tell everyone. And you negotiate it. And as long as everyone knows, uh, it seems to work. And, and that works in a receivership as well as an ABC? I think a receivership, LA, for Dr. Rebecca's receivership. We're, we're, so we're going to call these court. general receiverships. They have <laughs> and supervised. Yeah, I think they do. I, I, I'm sure that for sure that she probably gets to go in and have a motion with the sale process approved and things. I don't have that opportunity if there's no court. Yeah, I mean, there's pluses and minuses to not having the court. Um, even though I said it's foreign to me to do it without one, um, you know, the, the advantage is that everything is, you know, very, very public and everyone has a chance to come in and object and be heard. And the disadvantage is, of course, the same thing. <laughs> so, depending on how public you want it to be, um, you know, that can tweak the process one direction or another. Well, that's an interesting comment because I do believe when I talk to the clients on the first calls 
but part of what they're asking is, is this going to cost as much as an 11? Is it going to be as noisy in public? Is it going to be slow? And, and I believe that uh, the assignment for the benefit of creditors can be fast. It'll be relatively quieter. And by that, I mean the press that comes with the pleadings that you might have in a, in a bankruptcy. So that the debtor has to see their name in the paper every day where the case is filed. In an assignment, you're going to get plenty of press on the first few days when the employees are laid off or where they are laid off or the company closes its doors or is preparing. But again, I think that is mitigated by the fact that I spend a lot of time reaching out to the creditors and stakeholders so that they know the process and they know there's someone there to, to talk to. Yeah, I think the, the one visibility issue that comes up sometimes, the notoriety or lack thereof, is this is all state court, and unlike bankruptcy, you don't have PACER. And some state courts, where we've been involved in the ABCs, the receiverships, you can't go online and get pleading. So there's sort of the level of you know, how much you can access in some of these, and that could be good or bad, depending on who you're representing. But there are some counties and states where you actually have to go to the courthouse or call the clerk's office to get pleadings. Yeah, and that kind of reinforces the, you know, it's all very state specific. I was shocked when we did the one in Michigan last year and they're still, they're not even filing electronically. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. We were messing with some timing things and they're like, well, we have to get it to the courthouse. <laughs> oh, yeah, I remember. Um, yeah. And that's, I guess, I know there's a fair number of lawyers here, maybe most lawyers, I'm not sure, but I have seen a lot of um, New York lawyers, Chicago lawyers, et cetera, think they don't need local counsel. And I would say if you're going to be involved as a buyer, the lender, anybody's counsel, um, you should get somebody to talk to in that state. Because they are, some of it's in writing, some of it's in the statute, a lot of it's just, you know, practice and procedure and the way things are done. And it's, ever, it's more important than in a bankruptcy, as far as I'm concerned. So, so in bankruptcy, the debtor in possession or the debtor or the trustee is a fiduciary for the estate and, and the creditors of the estate. Do, do you have fiduciary duties to the company? Do you have fiduciary duties to creditors as well? As a receiver, as an S&E? The fiduciary duties yes. run to the creditors. In this kind of receivership that we're talking about, the duties run to all creditors. You know, in the rents and profits, uh, foreclosure type receivers, you know, then they run just to the plaintiff. Good insurance. That's <laughs> funny. In uh, Delaware, there's currently a, a battle in the Chancery Court as to whether S needs to be a secured bond. That's not a definition which the brokers or insurance people know. They know surety bonds. So, yeah, I need a surety bond if I'm in Delaware. And that also varies. In Wisconsin, we routinely get $10,000 bonds. I don't know why. <laughs> it's just what we do, and it works. Um, it really changes the, the cost of a case, um, depending on the size of the bond you end up having to have. But the Michigan case, which was relatively yeah. small, had a right. huge bond. It was, it was like a determining factor. It was two times the assets. What about uh, litigation in these kinds of proceedings? In a bankruptcy, if you have uh, an issue that's sort of related to the case, you could file an adversary proceeding to bring a contested matter. What if you have a company that is in a receivership or an assignment and there is an issue with equity, an issue with the lender? How does, how does that work mechanically if you had to deal with that? Well, you don't really have it. I'm not going to say you don't have issues with the lender, but if you have issues with the lenders, it's you know it's going to be dealt with in the receivership, and then if they don't want to participate, they you know, take their collateral and go file their foreclosure, replevin, money judgment action, right? Um, or potential bankruptcy, right? And they can do an involuntary. Sure, and that happens. You know, I've, I've had a couple of cases over the years where they've tried to do an involuntary. Um, there is the 120 day rule. Those are only with um, voluntary, with involuntary receiverships that doesn't apply. Um, in both of the times that I've had the involuntaries filed, the court is abstained or dismissed. Um, so, you know, we spend a lot of money then in bankruptcy court to just pick up and continue where I left off, <laughs> for the most part. That's what I'm seeing as well. And I think as long as you can prevent or present a cogent case to the bankruptcy judge, 
that you were doing everything that you needed to do, the notice, the creditors, your cell, and, and how it was all happening. Uh, in my experience, the last three times they, they've stayed. So, so companies and, and I guess their lenders, when they're in a situation where they're calling you, they, they've decided that they want to do something that is more cost effective than a chapter 11 bankruptcy, and they want to do something that's usually quicker than a chapter 11 bankruptcy. But there are creditors in these cases, just as there are in chapter 11 cases, other than the lenders to whom you owe fiduciary duties. What's the process to figure out what the claims are and what the legitimate claims are? And what happens if you have a dispute as to the validity of a claim? That's a good one. The claims process looks a lot like it does in a bankruptcy. When you have the books and records of people file the claims, you go through and study and evaluate whether there are variances or not. And work, you can work directly with the creditors to, to work those things out. Um, I think it gets harder when there's a dispute that you can't solve. And in that case, you hope you're in a case where you have a court. And if you don't, you're going to find some state court in California or Illinois to have to resolve those. I just use those as two examples that don't have statutory provisions. Yeah, and I would say with the statute, it looks almost exactly like it does um, in a bankruptcy. Um, the statutes specifically give the courts the, the ability to determine claims. Um, so you'll file objections, um, take it from there. I do my best to trip you up with your answers. So. <laughs> but one of the interesting things is, I think Rebecca in Wisconsin can go after preferences. And some states allow that. If less that's in the statute, you're not going to get to do that. In those states, you're probably limited to your fraudulent transfer type claims. Right, so Wisconsin has 120 days um, preference look back. You know, it looks different than it does. <laughs> In the code, because again, it's based on the act, um, so there's no defenses for starters. Um, but uh, I think Michigan had a, a preference provisions, and I know Minnesota does, and so they're definitely out there. I had an um, interesting case I'm wrapping up now where the, actually, I didn't think it was interesting at all when I got it, because the judge just called me, the court called me and said, the judge appointed you today, I didn't even know it was coming. Only time it's ever happened in this kind of a case. <laughs> um, but they had sold all of the operating assets um, 118 days after or before I was appointed. So I got appointed within the preference period from the closing on that sale. It was a, I think it was like 18, 14, something, I don't know, a chain of equities. Um, so I was appointed really to look at the sale, which is what I did, and a lot well, not surprise you, um, a bunch of the vendors got paid at closing, secured creditor allowed them to get paid even though they were undersecured, um, and I went back and sued them and brought money back in for preferences. So the buyer that bought um, out of that sale, you know, uh, we've heard from, is not thrilled uh, because they, what they thought they were getting was cooperation from the same vendors that ended up getting paid, and instead we got angry vendors. Um, so I, I would throw that out when Steve says we could do the sale before, during, after. I'm like, I'm kind of a big fan of after. <laughs> yeah, the preference issue is the one thing that buyers want to avoid with their vendors, for sure. Right, exactly. So you close, you know, after you're appointed, and then the whole thing could have been avoided. And you know what, at the end of the day, the sale would have looked pretty much like it did, right? Because it would have been negotiated, secured creditor would have agreed to a carve out, I would have given notice. The buyer could have bought the preference claims. They could have bought the preference claims. I give, you know, yeah. They could have been given to a lender as, you know, as additional collateral. And you typically see, much ways. with an ongoing operating business, when it's sold, you typically see the buyer, even if it's a credit bid from lenders and they're going to take ownership of the business, they want to make sure that they're in control of people getting sued and they want, they want to make sure that no one is actually going to end up prosecuting those claims and there's certain reason to do it. So. That, that's not a failure of that process, that was a failure in the sale process. What about federal um, and state regulatory agencies? They, they, they were all over the place in the Chapter 11 bankruptcy case. Do so you, you see them as involved in, in, in one of these alternative restructures? You do. I, I think I see almost all of them. Um, 
at some point or another. A lot of attorney generals for consumer claims, warranty claims, or deposits. The environmental Protection Agency or the state equivalents often come out. And I think that all of them appreciate that there's somebody there, a responsible party, serving as a fiduciary to make the process as efficient as possible. I think they appreciate that they can find that person and they know who to talk to with the, the project done or the issue resolved, or as a result as it's going to get. Yeah, I would say I've never had the experience where you know, the Department of Labor has said, no, I'm not going to talk to you. <laughs> I'll try to track the better down. Um, I, I, I like Steve said, I think they're, they're always there, depending on the case, you know, the agency. Um, and they're, they're as cooperative as they would be anywhere else. The one thing that uh, I'm seeing a lot more of, particularly in the middle market space, is with companies, especially on the retail side, we have a lot of leases, that bankruptcy isn't really a good fit because of the cost and kind of the associated like stigma with a bankruptcy case. Who do we hire? <coughs> How long is the case going to take? Uh, but also, kind of these alternative mechanisms may not be a good fit either. You have in the retail space, for example, companies that have a lot of leases. And the big variable is, how are you going to treat a lease if you're selling a company? In a bankruptcy case, you can assign leases, uh, notwithstanding anti-assignment provisions in a lease. And so that's hugely attractive for buyers that want to come in and pick up prime leases that may be under market, bring their applications that they can't independently get. Uh, but in some of these alternative mechanisms, you may not have a state that has a statute that has something like that. Uh, so there's no real good fit, and I've seen that a lot in the middle market space. Are you seeing companies uh, that are kind of adjacent to what we do that come into receiverships and ABCs, uh, for example, real estate advisors that try to help with those issues? so that you can kind of accomplish all that you would in a Chapter 11 outside of the bankruptcy. Yeah, I mean, there, there isn't the same, um, the statute's not the same, right? It, it doesn't like, carry the power of the bankruptcy code, even if it said the same thing. Like, I think it does in Minnesota. Um, you know, that being said, um, benefits to doing anything in, like, in any process are, you know, it, it breaks up the log jam and it lets everybody know that something's going to happen. So. You might not get where you want to, you might not get the negotiated result that you want with every landlord, um, but you're at least going to be able to have the discussion and the buyer, you know, figure out if the buyer is going to be able to uh, renegotiate those leases. I guess mostly what I'm saying is that they're too high, um, so the buyer wouldn't would not would not assume them anyway, um, and so the negotiation is a little bit a little bit different, and so then it is kind of the same negotiation you would have in a lot of. And yeah, there's definitely real estate professionals that come in and, and manage that process in the right case. Yeah. There's probably a couple here. Yeah. <clears throat> you mentioned preferences. What about other fraudulent conveyance actions? I mean, statutory law, state law, because we look at 544 under the bankruptcy court all the time, gives a creditor the right to bring for fraudulent conveyance actions in its capacity, trustee in its capacity as a creditor, or any creditor that exists at the time of the transfer thereafter. Do, do the, the Section 128, um, Chapter 128, or anything under non-statutory receivership ABC will allow the assignee or receiver to bring fraudulent events claims apart from the preferences we already discussed? I mean, I'm interested in what Steve has to say, but, but yeah, there is the hypothetical being creditor concept, so we don't bring them under the bankruptcy code, but we bring them under, you know, Wisconsin's Fraudulent Transfer Act. It's the same in, in my case, as long as state law per, uh, provides for a fraudulent transfer, or provides for you to go after the fraudulent transfer, yes, you can do that. It probably has a duty to do that, if it makes good business, otherwise it makes business sense. Yes. Talk, talk a little bit about the time frame. I mean, you know these cases generally are shorter than bankruptcy for lots of reasons, including notice requirements. But what is your typical, what I'll call fairly simple, straightforward liquidation, receivership, assignment look like from start to finish timings? I would say they are nine months to a year. 
Now, it depends on who you are in the party, right? If you're the, the management, you can be gone once the assignment took place or after the sale. If you're a creditor and there's a bar date for 120 days, I'm not going to do a distribution before the bar date's over. So there's 120 already. And if there is some outstanding weird thing that litigation you have to deal with or, uh, or claim that's, that's not yet liquidated, it can take a little bit longer. But for sure, the creditors are in for the 120 days. So great. Yeah, I mean, I would say the, the shortest the case will be open is probably five months. So you've got the 120 days plus time to close the case. Um, the, sometimes, you know, I've, I've done several cases where the sale is completely done within a month. Um, other times, you know, one, I operated a whey digester, most you probably don't even know what that is, um, <laughs> for like is a whey that? digester. Yeah. So take a byproduct of cheese and turn it into energy. <laughs> Um, operated that in receivership for, man, three and a half years, I think. You know, I've had development real estate in receivership for, like, I think that one lasted eight years. Um, so that it could get through the development process and become an IKEA. Um, <laughs> so, we talked about a couple of concepts in Chapter 11 that are very important to the process. Like raising financing, automatic stay. What about, what about releases? And I know there are separate panels on releases uh, over the course of many years because it's a hot topic in bankruptcy cases. What is the extent of the ability for a company or a lender to get a release after an ABC or receivership, if any? There aren't any releases in this assignment. I may have to, as part of a consent and subordination agreement with a security lender, I have to have a period of time where I can review their, their liens and get back to them. But other than that, they're not getting a, a release. It's never even come up that I know of, other than on this panel. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. And, and how about, we, we know um, debtors have claims and have, have rights that they can release and waive as part of the sale process. We see it all the time. Can, can you, as the assignee or the receiver, in exchange for whatever you thought made sense, maybe as part of your cash collateral negotiations, agree to give a lender a release, for example? Yes, that's for sure part and, of the discussion. And if they're asking, if you're asking them for cash collateral, they're probably asking you for releases. They are no sure. Correct. Okay. They have good counsel, they are. They should be. <laughs> they should be. And they should also get a security interest in those avoidance actions. And, and, and have those releases been tested? Because we, we read about appeals I mean, all day long in bankruptcy, and it's all over the place. I mean, you need to come to the assignment world, I don't see that. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. What about um, in, in the receiverships where you have a forum, you, you have a, a judge that's overseeing and signing an order. One of the issues that clients sometimes have with the bankruptcy, um, and I hate this term, but they'll, they're worried about activist judges, people that want to get involved. Uh, in a sale process, to maybe want to mark up an APA, uh, which has happened a few times, alarmingly. Um, do you see judges in these receivership cases take an active role that want to talk about releases or question jurisdiction? Is that a, is that a concern that you've seen come up? Yeah, almost never. Um, certainly seen that in bankruptcy court, but almost never in state court. Um, you know, last year I probably would have said never, except I had a a case that was filed and the judge, I, with my lawyer, because now I have to be quiet and let her talk, <laughs> um, I um, was in court for two hours just getting myself, just getting the order appointing me because the judge hated the process so much. Um, but that's the first time that's happened. Um, and what we were able to do then was move it to the commercial docket. So it was like substituting without substituting um, to get a different judge. But no, not usually. Usually they're just thrilled and, you know, they don't really understand all the nuances for the most part, you know, with some a couple of exceptions. And so they're happy if you go in and you've got everything's agreed and nobody's objecting. And, and if people do object, more often than not, they're going to look to the to the whatever the receiver is arguing um, and take take her lead. Yeah, and I've seen that in the cases I've been involved in, where there's a dispute that's come up. There's huge deference to what the receiver or the receiver's lawyer is looking to do. I'm making bad to that. 
most of the way I'm not in front of your judges. And those judges are inclined to be uh, activists. It's a good thing. For sure. It's a good thing. <laughs> You're surprised it's that way? Well, no, I do like when you find a judge that actually listens to the, to the case and wants to know. I think it's refreshing. Yeah. I think it's interesting the rise of the state court uh, business section or the, or the commercial section in state courts that uh, where I've seen really sophisticated buyers get more comfortable with a receivership is especially when they're buying assets or IP or something that's kind of unconventional and it's not a printing press or you know something that you could put on the back of a pickup or a flatbed. They, they want to know that there's a sophisticated person that's going to decide the dispute and whether or not they would typically be in a bankruptcy case or file involuntary, um, the rise of the business court section in state courts has had a huge impact uh, with my clients and whether they will consider buying something out of a receivership just because they, um, they know the judge, he or she may have been a former partner in a big law firm or, uh, you know, bank or whatever it is, term lawyer, but there is, um, I, I think one of the, the key reasons that you're seeing more of these is sophisticated buyers are getting more comfortable uh, with the process where you have a sophisticated form. That if there's a true dispute, there's someone that, that really knows the documents, knows the process, and knows the lawyers that are, that are going to be behind it. So, I'm fairly new to this world. So my extent before this panel was getting phone calls from the companies that we represent that didn't have enough money to file for Chapter 7 or Chapter 11, but for various reasons they might go through that process. And then we would introduce them to folks like you to walk them through the process of liquidating. So my takeaway from all of this is that this is a real alternative to a Chapter 7 liquidation or a Chapter 11 liquidation. In a case that doesn't have a very complicated capital structure where you're going to have a lot of fighting among first and second means, and where the assets are, are fairly easy to, to sell and liquidate. It's not a complex IP with lots of multiple people claiming rights and lots of litigation. But it, it really truly is an alternative and a more cost effective and a more timely one than a lot of the Chapter 11 situations that we've seen in the past where there was no alternative but to go into a Chapter 11 or Chapter 7 and sell. And I don't think there's a corollary as we started between the number of Chapter 11 filings decreasing and, and these receiverships going up. But, but, I, but I do see that there is an alternative. I, I agree with that. And I think that we will see a lot of assignments in all industries that have a lot of IP. That's, where we're, that's what's going to be the trend going forward. Definitely. Last we, couple of minutes. Do we have any questions? Here we go. Uh, is there any size restrictions? And I'm not sure if it was covered because it's a little hard to hear some of the uh, presentation back here, but are there any size restrictions as it relates to liability side or asset side where this doesn't work? The size doesn't matter. I think. Go ahead. How are Warnack claims managed? That's a good one. Yeah. Born and claims. By and large, the debtor, creditor, or the asset, the asinor is, well, I asked him before I even talked to him, do you have a warrant issue? And they, they say go, no. Generally, <laughs> they say no. And then I ask them if they have counsel, and then they come back. And let's say they do. It is much easier, like in bankruptcy, if that warrant notice was given pre assignment. Now, that's not going to solve them all. I have a case currently where the company was arguing that uh, related parties uh, were responsible for more. And that hasn't been decided, and I don't think that it will be decided that way. But in most cases, you're going to use the warrant, and they get, they get a claim form, they can put their warrant amount down if they have it, they can put it down even if they don't have it, and uh, we reconcile later. A lot of these, if you're going to have that many employees, you probably have a lot of debt, secure uh, money that's owed before we're going to get to that. But as long as I know the rules and who the creditors are, they can get paid. Yes? Sorry. 
Queen of the Susie. Oh. <laughs> yes, so we do a lot of health care receiverships, and we do a lot in federal court. So we try to get, uh, obviously, diversity. And if we're able to get diversity, those judges, they're great. It's just like bankruptcy. And we do very large cases. So it, it works out well. So I, I know most of your talk is about state receiverships <laughs> court, but federal court is uh, also a great alternative to bankruptcy. That's a really good point. You, you don't see those a lot outside of healthcare, but that's, uh, if you can get the federal form, I mean, and the judge um, to move it along, that's, that's a great alternative. Yeah, much cheaper. We're back. Hi. Hi. Um, how does this, for a smaller creditor, or a smaller debtor, excuse me, how does the process compare like a subchapter yes. file, which seems to be fairly streamlined and cost effective? It seems like a similar way to Well, I think the biggest difference is that there is going to be a sale in a receivership, right? I mean, there is no, nobody, there is no absolute priority rule. There is no reorganization. There is no plan. Um, the closest you're going to get is a sale back to an insider, you know, with a, with a different, a, a cleaned up balance sheet. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I do think we're seeing more sub fives. Um, they're taking some of the. Um, some of what would have been receiverships a few years ago. Um, but I think it might be because the debtors think that there's a way that they can reorganize. And frankly, the absolute priority rule is probably driving a lot of it. Or the lack of it. I think we're uh, out of time. Thank you.